Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, wonderful to be here on such an exciting day. I think many of us uh, heard the press conference, uh, what was it, day before evening, Indian time, and uh, we've all been on a high since then. It's wonderful to be uh, here to celebrate that great um, occasion again here today and also celebrate the work of our own scientists in India and also in particular in the TIFR system here in ICTS. Also very nice for me to be here at ICTS, which is now getting going uh, in, in, in a you know, very remarkable way. I've already been here for a science program a few months ago. I'm here back again, and I think that shows to me, and many of us also might have been coming here now more than once, shows to us all that it's really becoming a, a hive of activity as it well should be. So that's also a very nice thing for me to experience as I stand here. Rajesh, uh, thank you very much for that inspiring uh, talk at the beginning. Indeed, it's a great moment for us all. It's been said in the newspapers, but it was exactly my thought, so let me say it again. It really is a little bit like that moment when we can only imagine Galileo must have looked through the telescope and see the heavens open up. And here, for the first time, we have the heavens opening up to us in an entirely new way of looking, where we look through the ripples of space and time themselves. Who knows what wondrous things we'll find looking into the future, Already this one event which we'll talk about is so amazing. So I think it's the dawn of, I think it's the dawn of a really exciting era. And uh, wonderful to be here today to participate in it. Thank you. So um, our first speaker today is uh, Professor uh, P. Ajit, who's played a key role in, in these uh, discoveries. And he's here to tell us himself. He's from ICTS. And um, one of my unfortunate tasks is that I have to keep time so I just remind Ajit that he has 30 minutes as per the program, and I won't subject that to quantum or classical space-time fluctuations. So please <laughs> adhere to that. Okay, Ajit. Thank you very much, and, uh, and good morning, and uh, thank you, thank you all of you uh, for being here. Uh, to share this excitement of this first uh, discovery of gravitational waves from a binary black hole system observed by LIGO a few months before. So um, I'm pretty sure that by now everyone is familiar with gravitational waves. Uh, but let's, uh, to give a quick uh, recap, the existence of gravitational waves is, is one of the most intriguing predictions of the general theory of relativity proposed by uh, Albert Einstein in, in, in 101 years before, actually. But the prediction uh, that these Einstein's wave equations uh, um, ad admit, Einstein's equations admit wave-like solutions, that the gravitational waves actually came in 1916 for the first time. So we are already celebrating uh, the 100-year uh, anniversary of the prediction of uh, gravitational waves by Einstein. So uh, gravitational waves are uh, freely propagating oscillations in the geometry of space-time. So a popular analogy that people make is they are like ripples in a pond, ripples that propagate through space-time. Um, just like uh, any acceleration of charge distribution with a time-varying uh, dipole moment produce electromagnetic radiation, any acceleration of masses with a quadrupole, time-varying quadrupole moment produce a gravitational waves. There is no dipole radiation in, in, in general relativity. Um, until uh, last few months, uh, still we did have uh, observational evidence that gravitational waves indeed exist. Uh, this came from the observation, radio observations of binary pulsar system, uh, two pulsars, two neutron stars orbiting each other, and, and which can be observed by, uh, by their radio emission. So uh, a remarkable system is, is, uh, is called the PSRB 1913 plus 16 in, in astronomers' uh, strange uh, naming convention. Uh, they are popular, it's uh, popularly known as the Hulse-Taylor binary. So um, what people have done is, you know, this is a, a system of new, two neutron stars orbiting each other and radiating energy into gravitational waves. As a result, their uh, orbital separation decreases, so uh, would be the orbital uh, period, uh, which can be observed, which has been observed by 
uh, observing radio signals from uh, the system over, over, over uh, three decades. So what's shown here is a uh, year, the time in years, uh, just spanning about three decades. And the vertical axis is a cum cumulative shift in the periastron time of this uh, eccentric binary. And these uh, black dots are the uh, radio observations. And uh, this uh, black line is, is a prediction from the general relativity, just leading order calculation as coming from uh, energy loss due to gravitational radiation. So this prediction uh, of the change in the orbital period uh, agrees with the observed value in 0.2% accuracy. So this is already one of the most remarkable uh, astronomical measurements that we have, uh, we have seen. And what, is, uh, what has been happening in the last uh, couple of decades is uh, a large international efforts to directly detect gravitational waves going through the Earth uh, on a variety of frontiers. And one particular method is using uh, laser interferometers, large-scale laser interferometers. So they work on the principle that when uh, gravitational waves pass through the Earth, they produce a time-dependent change in the geometry of space or the spatial metric. So for example, if the gravitational wave is passing perpendicular to the screen, and if you arrange a ring of test particle, a freely falling test particle, they get deformed in a very characteristic way, like a tidal force. So for example, the, uh, uh, the ring get uh, stretched to one direction and compressed in the other direction. Uh, and in the next cycle, this, this basically starts science. Uh, just like electromagnetic waves, gravitational waves also contain two polarization states. Uh, their effect is uh, practically the same, except that the the axis of deformation is stretched and uh, is rotated by an angle of 45 degrees. And these changes can be detected using uh, interferometers. So uh, as you know, an interferometer, a simple Michelson interferometer, basically you have a, a coherent laser beam that is split into two, two, uh, two parts and sent into two orthogonal amps, which get reflected by two mirrors, and they recombine here. And when a gravitation, you know, initially the interferometer is locked in such a way that uh, this uh, interference is destructive, that you observe a dark fringe here. And when a gravitational wave passes through it, one arm gets stretched, which will cause a, a net change in the time of arrival of the reflected light, which uh, makes a change in the interference pattern that, that we can record using a photodetector. Uh, so that's how a simple uh, interferometer works, uh, proposed by Michelson. Uh, but the uh, experimental challenge here is that the expected distortion due to the passage of gravitational waves is uh, extremely tiny. So uh, if you take, uh, took a, uh, a particularly loud source of gravitational wave in, in, the, in the scale of gravitational waves, for example, the merger, in spiral and merger of two neutron stars in a, in a nearby, nearby cluster of galaxies, the Virgo cluster, which is located about 20 megaparsec, the expected strain that we see in the interferometer, the delta L by L, well, the delta L is the change in the arm length and the L is the arm length itself, is of the order of uh, 10 to the minus 21. So this means that if you want to measure this uh, change in the differential change of the arm length, even if you have a kilometer scale instrument, you should be able to measure differential changes in the arm length of the order of 10 to the minus 18 meter, which, uh, as you know, is uh, you know, a thousand times smaller than the size of an atomic nucleus. So this is really the remarkable uh, measurement challenge that uh, the LIGO and the sister project had to undertake. And uh, that has been achieved. So uh, the, these are the aerial photographs of the two LIGO detectors in the US. These are two uh, complicated Michelson interferometers with arm length four kilometer each. And an, inter an international network of detectors, uh, some in, in, in Europe and, and, and in Japan, have uh, already done several uh, science runs in the, in the last uh, 10 years using their first generation of these instruments. And as you all know, there has been no detection of gravitational waves. But this non-detection was consistent with our uh, expectation of astrophysical signal that would produce gravitational waves of detectable strength. Things changed in the last six months. On uh, September 14, 2015, in the morning of the U UTC in Universal Time, Two LIGO observatories in, in Hanford in the northwestern uh, United States and in Livingston in the southeast of the uh, United States detected a coincident gravitational wave signal. The signals arrived in the two detectors with a time uh, separation of about 7 milliseconds. And the combined signal to noise ratio of this event is of the order of 24, which was a remarkable um, uh, signal to noise ratio. Nobody was expecting the first signal to be this loud. So we 
Uh, several of you, of you must have heard this from uh, Gabriela Gonzalez's uh, talk at the NSF uh, headquarters. So if you want to, uh, you know, these uh, gravitational waves uh, are in the frequency band of the audio signals that, that we have basically, our ears are sensitive to. So it's uh, possible to uh, actually listen to this uh, by a little bit of uh, manipulation of the data. Can I have the audio, please? Okay, so I'll explain what uh, you, you just have heard. So what you heard for the first two times is basically the actual the conversion of the observed frequencies by appropriately band passing the data into playing in a, in a, in a, in a, in a loudspeaker. But uh, you could barely hear a thump. And then the, so you basically then heard two, uh, the signals that observe the two detectors. And the next sound bite is basically artificially shifting the frequencies to slightly higher frequencies so that you are basically able to hear them better. It's like a pseudo coloring. Basically, you know, you're seeing a photograph in x-ray, for example. So, uh, and then uh, they, you know, the, the original uh, signal is played back, the original low frequency signal. So let me play once again. This is basically the signal that, uh, that, we, that the LIGO detectors observed. So, the, uh, so it basically lasted uh, a small fraction of a second, about 0.2 seconds, basically the whole thing. But uh, the observed signal is remarkably consistent with the prediction of Einstein general theory of relativity. And uh, so, for example, this is the uh, observed data from the two detectors in Hanford and Livingston. Uh, the time is in the horizontal axis, so the, it's basically the, the it's about uh, 0.2 milliseconds, the whole duration. Sorry, 0.2 seconds, I'm sorry. And this is the uh, observed signal, and this is the prediction uh, of the expected signal from such a system that we would observe in, from the disk detectors. And these, uh, the consistency is remarkable, which you can see by eye by just subtracting the best fit signal from the data, so the residual is uh, completely consistent with the pure noise. So this already gives us a very strong indication that you know, what we have seen is a real signal, but of course there are a number of uh, checks that are done to confirm this, which I will elaborate later. So the signal that we observed in LIGO is consistent with the signal expected from the coalescence of two black holes to their in spiral and eventual merger and ring down. And this is shown in this cartoon here, again the horizontal axis this time, uh, these two black holes uh, orbit uh, for a few cycles before they merge to each other to form a single excited curved black hole, which radiates away its uh, deformation into a spectrum of uh, characteristic oscillations called quasi-normal modes, and settles down to a stationary care black hole. And this is uh, the prediction of a signal that we expect from such a coalescent signal. And this is indeed what we have observed. Uh, two independent searches of gravitational waves uh, detected the signal. The first detection was made by a search that looked for generic uh, transient that are coherent between the two detectors. And the first signal was actually observed within the three minutes of latency. The soon after, uh, three minutes after the arrival of signal, it reported a trigger and everybody in the, in the collaboration got an email uh, in, in about three minutes. And this was followed up by a, a dedicated match filter based analysis that looks for specific signal shape in the data using uh, models of, uh, relativistic models of the binary black hole uh, expectation signal. And uh, this is what, this is called a five sigma detection. So the uh, probability that uh, any other source other than a gravitational wave signal uh, produces a trigger like this is less than 10 to the minus seven. The false alarm probability is less than 10 to the minus ten, uh, seven. Which is, which if, you, if you translate it to Gaussian significance, it's greater than 5.1 sigma. This is uh, only a lower uh, limit of the significance. So the significance can only be uh, greater than the 5.1 uh, sigma. And we will need actually more data to, to see what is the actual significance. So currently, this is a lower limit on the significance. So if you translate this into a false alarm rate, it corresponds to a false alarm rate of 1 per 200,000 years. So it's extremely unlikely for anything other than a gravitational wave signal that is from this particular source to produce this trigger in the data. And I'm very glad to note that 
that has been fundamental contributions from India in, in, in modeling this expected source of gravitational wave. We have veterans sitting in our uh, front row, Bala Iyer, and similar contribution in developing uh, data analysis method that went into these searches by Sanjeev Durandar at Ayuka and his, uh, and they're basically a whole generation of uh, students and postdocs and colleagues. Uh, this is a cartoon from New Yorker that appeared yesterday. So uh, there has been a, a number of, you know, we, as I said, the collaboration, essentially the, the, detect, the first detection was made three minutes after the arrival of signal. The rest of the five months essentially went into making sure that this is indeed a gravitational wave signal and doing the subsequent analysis. So uh, uh, both the detectors, although this was uh, slightly before what is the, what we call a science run of the advanced LIGO, both detectors in a steady state of operation for several hours around the event. So there is complete, there's absolutely no evidence that this could be an instrumental artifact. And there has been a large number of uh, checks done to make sure that the, the, a large array of environmental monitors, such as seismometers, magnetometers, microphones, etc., uh, tens of thousands of them, uh, have detected any environmental disturbances that could potentially couple to this uh, gravitational wave detector producing this observed signal. And there has been also an exhaustive check of a possibility of signal injections either in hardware or in the software that we, uh, that we might misunderstand as a real gravitational wave signal. So all of this uh, work has direct contribution from several uh, Indian groups. Uh, the observed shape of the uh, signal allows us to decipher the, the parameters of the source. So uh, based on this observed data, uh, the scientists con uh, concluded that uh, what we have seen is the, the in spiral and merger of two black holes with masses 36 and 29 solar mass uh, orbiting in a nearly circular orbit, merging and forming a, a rapidly spinning black hole of mass 62, 62 solar mass and a spin of 0.67, which is uh, where in the units where the extremal the spin is, is one. So it's, it's, the, the, the final black hole is spinning at a 67% of the maximum possible spin of a black hole in general relativity. So I'm uh, very glad to say that this is one of the most uh, uh, accurate, probably the best measurement, one of the best measurements of black hole mass and spin in, in astronomy, comparable to any other measurements done so far. So uh, of course, due to the presence of the noise, we, are, you know, the, the, we cannot make absolute measurements. So we always have error bars on this. So what we measure, what we construct is the posterior distributions of the, uh, the parameters of the binary given the observation. So this is one such posterior distribution of the mass and the spin of the final black hole. So you see that the peak value is about 62 solar mass of the final black hole, and the spin value is about 0.67. Uh, and this is basically the 90% you know, confidence uh, uh, interval, including the statistical and systematic errors. So I'm very glad to say again that this also, this, in particular the estimation mass and spin of the final black hole uh, has a direct contribution from uh, ICTS group and which was basically proposed by Einstein, uh, the ICTS group a few months before actually. So uh, this is the very first detection of a binary black hole. And this is uh, the very first observation of a stellar mass black hole with mass greater than 25 solar mass. The, uh, this is really, nobody was expecting really a black hole of this mass uh, at this point. And, uh, uh, and if, for people who are uh, more interested in the technical details, the primary black hole has a mass of 36 with uh, uh, error bars. Secondary black hole has a mass of 29, which form the final black hole with a mass of 62 solar mass and they're rapidly spinning uh, at a rate of 0.67 in dimensional spin. The distance to the system was estimated to be 410 megaparsec, which uh, translates to 1.3 billion light years. And we are not sensitive to gravity, you know, gravitational detectors are not able to measure the redshift, the cosmological redshift directly. But assuming a cosmology, we can convert the luminosity distance to a redshift value, and it's about uh, 0.1. And all of these are 90% credible interval, including statistical and systematic errors. And uh, to sort of uh, continue with the sort of extreme numbers, this is uh, the most powerful astronomical source observed ever in terms of the luminosity of the source, not necessarily the energy output. So uh, as Rajesh, as we heard from Rajesh this, this morning, uh, about 3% of the solar mass, uh, sorry, three solar mass worth of mass is converted into energy and was released into a very, very small amount of time, about 0.1 second, and most of the, uh, the power is radiated in a few milliseconds uh, during the merger and during, uh, the, during the merger part. 
And this corresponds to a peak power emission of 10 to the 49 watts, which, uh, you know, to just give a comparison, this is the luminosity of this event is 50 times more than the luminosity of all the stars in the universe put together. And this estimation also, you know, you can also make, you know, you can make simple estimates of this using very simple analytical calculations. But if you want to really get accurate estimates that include statistical and systematic errors, you really have to, again, use fits to the large-scale uh, binary black hole simulations uh, that are already available. And this has a direct contribution, again, from the ICTS group. This uh, signal allowed us for the, for the first time to test the, the predictions of Einstein's theory in a hitherto unexplored, uh, unexplored regime of uh, extreme velocities uh, and, and extreme gravity, where, for example, the last uh, uh, cycles of the in spiral, these black holes are moving at a velocity of close to half the speed of light. So, uh, and all of these tests uh, essentially came out uh, proving Einstein right again. I'm using sort of the colloquial language. But, uh, so the precise statement I want to make is that all the observed data is consistent with the predictions of Einstein theory within our statistical uncertainties. And there has been a number of tests. Uh, for example, uh, if you subtract the best fist signal from the observed data, the residual is fully consistent with the, the noise of the detector. And the, the mass and spin of the final black hole, estimated purely from the in-spiral part, the early part of the, of the, of the waveform, uh, agrees uh, very well with the same estimated from the last part of the signal, which is after their merger. Uh, again, a contribution from the ICTS group. And the final part of the signal is uh, consistent with the, the quasi-normal mode ringing, which is uh, actually predicted by C. V. Um, uh, in 1970, who will be incidentally here in, uh, in the later uh, part of this uh, event. And again, the post-Newtonian coefficients uh, extracted from this observed event is, is fully consistent with what is calculated from the general relativity. There is no evidence of deviation from the uh, predicted values. Uh, again, worked by a number of colleagues uh, who are uh, in this uh, audience. And the propagation uh, effects of gravitational waves is, is fully consistent with a massless uh, graviton. There is no evidence of dispersion that we see in the data. Okay, uh, let me uh, conclude here. Uh, so, I, so all of us used to conclude many of our talks by showing pictures of the universe as observed from different uh, uh, electromagnetic windows of the universe, starting from radio to gamma rays. And recently, uh, astronomical observations using non-electromagnetic uh, messengers, such as high-energy neutrinos, ultra-high-energy cosmic, cosmic rays, etc., also have become possible from uh, observatories such as uh, Ice Cube, Auger, etc. And uh, we used to conclude our talks uh, with this question mark uh, that, you know, we hope that the gravitational wave uh, sky would be very exciting, but we don't have a picture of it. And this is really the first picture of the gravitational wave transient sky. So the observed signal was uh, localized to a large annular region, which spans something like 500 square degrees. And the uh, poor sky localization is due to the fact that there are only two detectors operating at the same time, uh, you know, uh, basically at this point. So the, 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 the ability to triangulate the, the, the location of source from the observed time delay was rather poor. So if you really need to do astronomy using upcoming gravitational observations, which we hope to, to have more, we need more detectors in the network. And there are already some, some upcoming in, in Europe and, 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 and Japan. But uh, what we are more excited as gravitational astronomers as well as Indian scientists is the possibility of having a detector in India and that we hope uh, will come uh, very soon. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for overshooting the time. So I have two questions, actually. Uh, one of them is uh, that I, I was just trying to estimate the uh, flux that would have you know, crossed the Earth. And it's roughly about 0.1 watts or 0 0.01 watts per meter squared. Uh, so were there any, you know, uh, I mean, was there an optical analog of the signal? Or is there something else? I mean, uh, could you have seen this in some, in some other band? Because that's not so low, the flux of energy. Uh, that's one question. Maybe I can ask the second one afterwards. So uh, electromagnetic counterparts, uh, because there is, uh, you know, the, the understanding is there is no gas, there is no material uh, around this black hole because of the the in spiral over billions of years, millions of years at least uh, to the in spiral. So, actually, if I can just follow up, what about the accretion disks? And the so accretion on? disks all been stripped out at uh, very large distances. So uh, during the final stages, there was no matter. There could not, there could not have been any matter in the vicinity of the stellar mass objects. 
In any case, LIGO did send alerts to astronomers. This was followed up. Uh, and this, uh, the results will be announced as a, a separate paper in uh, the next few weeks. I I okay. uh, just one more question. The three. It's yeah, none of this is not surprising in the standard astronomical sort of expectations. So, so since there are many hands up, can, can we sure, take it's, a it's few questions okay, from sure. others? Is it, and then you ask in private. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so Ajit, uh, I mean, this has been uh, this instrument has been on for quite some time. So is this really the only event that occurred? I mean, or I mean, uh, like for so many years, uh, or uh, I mean, it was really a large signal. That's why it yeah. got. So the 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 first science round of like advanced LIGO went for about four months. But the duty cycle of the instrument is of the order of 60%. So at the end, you know, we have uh, something like 20, uh, sorry, two months of uh, quality data. But this whole analysis came from only 16 days. The, you know, this full, full analysis results from this first observation run is still going on. So the first results that uh, we have reported here came from only the 16 days of, of, of the data. So we have some more data coming up, and the ex results are expected in the next few months. But uh, from this stretch of data, there's only one, one, one significant event. Let me use the opportunity. Oh, there's one more. OK. Rohini and. In your talk, you had already said this, that one can estimate, the base, the, given the sensitivity of your detector, yeah. uh, what kind of event is required to happen yeah. for you to see it, yeah. and then one can estimate what are the probabilities of such yeah. events happening. So yeah. in terms of that, can one answer the question that I don't know who will ask? So you know, based on the observed uh, event and the amount of observable data and using some models of um, you know, mass function of black holes, et cetera, we have an estimate of the uh, coalescent rates of binary black holes in the universe. And that still has a large amount of uncertainty. It's about two to 400, uh, so one every year per uh, Two to four hundred gigaparsec cube. Um, it's hard to interpret, but uh, yeah, that's the number that we have. Yes. Yeah. It, the, all, the, the, the rate is cons broadly consistent with all the sort of the broad models that predict event rates for binary black holes. But if I can just follow up on that, you know, before this event, one of the things that always worried me was when you asked about event rates, there was a four orders of magnitude yeah. uncertainty. Yeah. Right? Now, I know it's all statistics, but yeah. given that you've seen one event. It has reduced to two orders of magnitude uncertainty. So it's about two orders of magnitude. Yeah, yeah roughly, yeah. So it could I be the only event of the century, but, uh, but let's hope not. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I want to know but it, it's an extremely unlikely to see an, a very luminous event uh, without that. Have there been any skeptics who doubt this whole thing? Has there been any criticism in the last three days? Uh, I haven't seen any, but I must say that I have not been able to follow the news very closely also. But certainly the, the paper has been peer reviewed, uh, so it has crossed at least one level of fitting I mean, outside the, the collaboration. I think you already answered this question, but I'm not very sure this. Uh, See, how often you expect these events, if you can tell in terms of years or something, so that, uh, I mean, like, uh, how many years, next event, uh, statistically, how many years we have Right, to so you know, the, all the estimate came from models of population synthesis models of this coalescence of the system, and these have large amount of uncertainty, four orders of magnitude, as uh, Sandeep said. So it could be, the estimate were uh, as low as a few, you know, point 0.1 per year to few thousands per year. So we have narrowed down to a, Another two out of the magnitude, but not better than that yet. We need some more data to, 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 to make more uh, precise uh, estimates. Okay, I think so one last uh, okay, comment, one last actually, sorry. Uh, so uh, these uh, X-ray uh, you know, signal detectors, which sort of quickly tell you if there's a transient in the sky, are there all the time. So I would sort of uh, suspect, you know, given there is a lot of theoretical uncertainty about whether there is gas from the accretion disk and all that. Mm. Just from the fact that you know, SWIFT and all these electromagnetic transient observatories are up there, if they had, you know, they just put out an alert whenever they, they see something. If they had seen something, we would have you know, just yeah. you know, heard about it. So I'm pretty sure that there was nothing coincident yeah. seen with it 
for this particular event at least. So the big catch is that you know, your, uh, uh, your uh, accuracy of estimating the sky location of the source is pretty large. That's pretty so there's a random probability that there'll be some random event. That, you know, it's not insignificant that there'll be a random event happening in, a, uh, in the patch of the sky that is consistent with your you know, re, you know, located uh, area. Right. So but that you know, this must not be very bright. Otherwise, some of these which are broad, you know, they're looking throughout the sky would have seen yeah. this in other, you know, wave bands. Anyway.